Hi, everyone. It's Jen DeWall here. And on this week's episode of The Leadership Habit, we are going to be sharing with you tips to tell better stories. I sat down with Keith Bailey, who has a passion or who has had a passion for public speaking since experiencing a seminal moment in the fourth grade. From the hospitality industry to global corporate sales, he learned the power of storytelling for profit, influence, and of course, fun. With 16 years as a personal and corporate coach, Keith is motivated by the success of others in his quest to help you live a life well-spoken. Knowing that good speakers are created and not born, Keith started Articulated Intelligence to help prevent unintentional audience abuse through a proprietary gamified storytelling technique called With One Word. I hope you enjoy our conversation. You're going to be hearing us play live time, one word, and I hope that you walk away with tips to tell better stories. Hi, everyone. It is Jen DeWall. And on this week's episode of the Leadership Habit Podcast, I am sitting down with Chief Storyteller Enabler, Chief Story Enabler, Mr. Keith Bailey. Keith, welcome. Oh, wait, Keith, why? Wait, what? Why are you coming on live with this video? Why do you have a bag over your head right now, Keith? What do you mean? Like, why do you have a bag? This I, is the I, most I learned this. Start. <laughs> I, I learned this during the pandemic. Uh, this is how you can show up to uh, to virtual meetings with your camera off. Is like showing up to an in person meeting with a bag over your head. You know, I can do things under here that you can't see that I'm doing. <laughs> like, yep, you can feed yourself. You can probably be sleeping. I mean, I'm with you, Mr. Bailey. We've got to start showing up more on our camera. I get that Zoom fatigue is a real thing. But think about the reality of it. Would you go to a meeting in a conference room with a bag over your head like what Mr. Bailey is doing right now? The answer is absolutely not, Jen. Absolutely, absolutely not. Yeah. I'm glad it's, just, it's just it's just a little goof to to really point uh, a uh, a lens if you will to the importance of when we show up virtually is is to to show up and and to be there and to be engaged, right? I mean, just just the fact that you can only see from here up on me, you're already missing out on so much body language. And then we turn yeah. that camera off and it just, it just really leaves too much up to the imagination. It's too much for the, the listener to, to process. You're actually better off having a phone call. So if, if you're not going to have cameras on, resort back to the good old days and just call each other and have a conversation that way. Oh, I like that. Conference your team in. Don't put everyone, if we don't want to talk over Zoom, we get it, right? Acknowledging the reality of Zoom fatigue or WebEx fatigue, whatever that might be, that it happens. But that sometimes, because we're going to be talking about storytelling today, that if you're trying to influence someone and yet it looks like you're not engaged or it's hard to tell if they're engaged, which can maybe distract you from getting your message across that, pick up the phone. Yep. It's a concept. (laughs) And you know, not everything has to be Zoom. I think when 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 all this fun and game started, we thought like Zoom, 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 and we are learning now that that's not always the case. Yeah. Now I've had quite a few client conversations that I've had that are just by by phone, and it's nice to have that that differentiation. So if you're going to be living in this virtual realm, either have a phone call or have the agreements to where hey. You don't need to show up to this meeting and have your camera on. But if it's if it's a board meeting or if it's a uh, something where you really need to come across, you need other people, you need to be able to see your audience. Perhaps the social graces on that is, hey, we all agree that we'll all have our cameras on. Yeah, I love that. I think it's important, especially for people that maybe. Let's think about even the people on the team, and I know we're going to get into storytelling, but maybe people that aren't even as comfortable talking in public or speaking up in a meeting that sometimes having your camera off can be a little bit intimidating because it might make them think that they don't really care what you have to say or that they're not really paying attention. And so that can even add more pressure when you're trying to communicate. Yeah. So Keith, I, you know, I love working with you. I'm so excited to have you here on the show. You're a chief story enabler. What does that mean? How did you come to be, you have your company articulated intelligence? Tell us about yourself and what your organization does. Yeah, yeah. The the whole chief story enabler, it came about because a lot of clients that we work with, when we start talking about storytelling, they're like, oh, I've got no great stories to tell. Nothing exciting has ever happened to me. And then once we take them through our uh, proprietary gamified approach of tapping into your bottomless story well of experiences and memories, the stories that come forth, people are like, oh my God, I do have a story to tell. And the answer is, yeah. If you've lived life, you've had experiences. 
the difference between a storyteller and a non-storyteller is the lens at which we look at the experience. So it, as a, as a non-storyteller, it's just a benign thing. As a storyteller, we look at that benign thing and we're able to, to shape it and craft it and add uh, resolution and meaning to it that gives it purpose and relevance. So when the, uh, when the audience, right, and let's talk about the Shakespearean, all the world's a stage. So if it's an audience of one in a networking situation or like yourself, you've got a keynote coming up in all places of Wichita, Kansas. I do. <laughs> <laughs> how we connect with that audience and how that story lands is, is absolutely critical. And how we tell that story will define whether we're going to be memorable or not. Yes. I, you know, storytelling is so important. It's funny. We have our family in town, my sister and or my sister-in-law and her husband are visiting us from Spain. And one of the things that she, that happened to come up over a dinner conversation is that she doesn't feel like she's a good storyteller and she just wishes that she could tell better stories. And she started giving examples of different friends. And I know that we're going to get into this, but a lot of people, you know, can shy away from wanting to even think about a story because they just automatically deem themselves as I, I can't tell a story. And I feel like it's the same thing as I'm not creative or I'm not innovative or innovative. Um, and so Keith, how did you become interested in storytelling as an art, as something that you can help leaders um, and organizations do better? The, the, the pivotal moment for me was after I left corporate America and I, I started down this venture of, of helping people uh, really with, with their presentation skills and with their stage skills, what started to come out of this was they would show up with all the content and all the data. They'd have all the facts and all the figures. Well, the thing with that is facts and figures, they fade. So we were always looking for a way to make the data and, and the content relevant. And what it always boiled down to was a story. Right? What are the stories that help support this? And one day I was out for, uh, for a run, you know, very much like uh, Einstein, I was out for his bike ride the day he thought of, of relativity, the theory of relativity. I was out for a run when I had the aha epiphany of like, hey, well, what if? What if we were to just look for stories? What if we were just to tap into people's story wells of experiences? Because we can take pretty much any story and be able to find meaning to it. It's one of the things that we as humans do. We look at our experiences and try to attach meaning to it. And from that, uh, our gamified approach called With One Word was, was created. And what we do with this is we take trigger words and then through a guided visualization, we show you how to start looking back into your experiences. We'll look at a very specific experience and then have you share that experience. And then we take it and we mold it and we shape and we attach meaning to it. That was really the, the aha moment for me was working with business professionals. But as, with regard to stories, stories are everywhere, right? From, from the moment we're born, the interactions we have and the stories that our parents tell us growing up to the fables, to, to the movies, to all these things that happen in our lives are always delivered to us in the form of stories. So when did I first become aware of stories? Gosh, um, probably when I, when I look back over my, my life and my childhood, right? I grew up in Holland and Holland is a very uh, enchanted place of, of canals and bricks and moss and, you know, the kabouters and all the things that happen in fairy tales. That's probably my first, uh, my first uh, interaction with stories as a kid. Oh my gosh. And it's such a, you know, I love that it's talking about how facts and figures fade. You know, the one thing that always stands out because you and I know each other outside of this is, mm -hmm. and it will always stick with me. If you want to know one of the lines, or I would say the missions of Keith Bailey, it's to prevent, and this is your phrase, but I love it. Unintentional audience abuse. Tell me what that is, because I think it's an important thing for us to remember as we go out to think about who we're trying to influence, what we're communicating, is that we ultimately want to prevent unintentional audience abuse. Tell us what that is from your own words. I just love that expression. And I think it's really helpful. We want to obviously make a great experience where people, you know, hear what we're trying to say, they connect, so on and so forth. But what does unintended audience abuse really mean? So the unintentional side of it is the, the speaker, the presenter doesn't mean to do it. They're, they're not doing it with malice. It's unintentional. And we have all been the recipients of it. And yes. 
guilty party. I have I have abused my audience. And the way audience abuse comes about is when you're just espousing facts and figures and data. Uh, you're umming, you're on, you're so and you're never getting to the point. One of the most grievous ones that I've experienced was a, uh, a presenter who, when it was their turn to speak, the PowerPoint slide came on with this beautiful image, and then the lights went dark, and suddenly I felt her sitting down next to me, and then it went to the next slide, it was all this information, and she started to read from the front row with her back to the audience, her entire presentation. The reason I, I talked to her afterwards, I'm like, why, why, why would you do that? She's like, well, I, they need to know these things, and and this is the only way that I know that I that I can ensure that they get all the information. Uh, I was like, that that makes total sense. Yeah. While this approach is is right for for the betterment of the audience, what we know is that that's not how you connect with your audience. That's not how you win them over because they don't remember what you say. They remember how you made them feel. And, and I remember who, who imparted this statistic upon me, but it, it's just stuck with me because it's just a, a good litmus to move forward with. When you get done speaking, your audience will forget 50% of what you said within about the first 30 minutes. If you're a good speaker, they'll remember 5% of what you said one week later. 5%? 5%. So that's if you're a good speaker. Now, we've all seen those incredible speakers, but try to go back and remember those incredible speakers. How much of it do you remember of what they said? You remember how they made you feel. Yes. You remember perhaps some of the, the messages that they, that they carried forth. You might even remember a story that they shared. So when we look at how we communicate, what we teach is moving away from a sense of presenting and starting to build more out what we call a facilitation. And a facilitation has multiple parts to it. It has your content and your data. You, you need to get that part across. It has the stories that you can tell that relate to your content and your data. This next part, part is incredibly pivotal. It has audience participation. When the audience participates in the actual experience, now they have a stake in the outcome. And the audience will do whatever they can to make sure that the outcome is a favorable one. So now you've got their buy into it. And then you need to have the audio and the visual piece to come into it. When you bring those things into, uh, into play and you're constantly moving between them and having this facilitation, you have a greater chance of avoiding unintentional audience abuse. Because here's the thing, Jen, with an audience. And if, if, if there's one thing you walk away with today and the next time you're standing before an audience and you're having to present, just know this. The audience wants only one thing. They want you to succeed. They want you to be successful. They want you to win. They are your biggest champion. They are rooting for you the entire time. And the reason they do that is because they can see themselves standing where you're standing and it scares the hell out of them. So know that your audience is very empathetic to your mission and to your plight and to what you're there to do. And all they want you to do is win. So all you need to do is give them what they want. And a facilitation, is, my experience, is one of the best ways to deliver that level of engagement because you're also speaking to all the different ways that people learn and retain information. And the kinesthetic part of it is, is critical. So knowing that they're only going to take away 5%, and each audience member is going to remember a different 5%. What 5% are they going to remember? Right. Which is why content, stories, audience participation, audio and visual all play into that complete mix of that facilitation. Yes. Oh, my gosh. And so important. I love that you give, I think even just for those that are listening that are might maybe a little reluctant to want to get into storytelling, or maybe you're just nervous about public speaking because that absolutely happens. I really like the point that you said that your audience wants you to succeed. So as a starting point, if any of you are nervous and trust, they want you to succeed because they obviously also want to return on their time investment. They want to make sure that they're, you know, getting something out of it. They want it to be fun. They do want you to succeed. Mm -hmm. So you started an organization, and I know you have a few counterparts, called Articulated Intelligence. Can you tell us a little bit about what Articulated Intelligence does? Yeah, Articulated Intelligence, our focus is to help business professionals live life well-spoken. And I mentioned earlier that we believe that all the world is a stage. So we've created 
uh, modules and training platforms that work with business professionals on those different stages. Uh, for one of them, that's a really popular one for us right now, is the networking stage. We've all been told, go out, network, build your network. It's incredibly important. You need to network. Yet no one has ever taught us how to network. Right? What is it? Showing up, going to the bar, getting loaded, and asking everybody what is that they do, and just having you know superficial connection? No, that is not networking. Right. Networking not meaningful conversation. (laughs) Not meaningful conversation. So what we teach is uh, we teach you how to maximize your RON, your return on networking, and we build out a strategic plan that's really specific to the individual. You get to build out your own plan of how it is that you're going to prepare for this networking event. What are the permissions you're going to give yourself, right? My goal is to have three meaningful conversations and then I can leave if I so choose. We, we never really go about doing that. Like we feel like we're gonna be here for a period of time and I really don't know what I'm going to accomplish. So to have the strategic part of it is great. The other thing that we teach you is through actually this methodology called with one word is how to become a really good listener to when people hit trigger words that trigger memories for you. Because when you're speaking, even during this podcast right now, our audience, we know that you have left this room and come back again. Perhaps I mentioned something about Europe that made you think of something, your travels through Europe. Perhaps I mentioned something about the PowerPoint presentation and you too had that that experience. So in a networking event, we have these little jumping off points. All you need to do is listen, have a jumping off point, keep it in, in the back of your mind as the person is speaking. And then once they're done speaking, you can do one of many things. You can say, oh my God, I'm so there with you. I too had this experience one time. And then you bring the focus back to them. But I'm really interested in more about this point. Can you tell me about that? That is a strategic thing that you can do to have an engaging conversation with anyone. So networking is, is a really big uh, platform for us. Uh, another area that we work on is on, on keynote presentations. Uh, but one of the big ones is uh, the conversations you're having with your customers. Because a huge thing that we focus on is teaching you how to put people before profession. I had a boss many, many years ago when I sold cycling apparel, spandex, everything. <laughs> and and he, he, he told me, he said, he said, Keith, people don't buy from companies. They buy from other people. So don't, don't try to bring the company first. Build the personal relationship. And then over time, you'll build that relationship. They'll be able to come on board. And what I learned from that is the best relationships that I had and the best clients that I had, it took me time to build that relationship. The ones where I didn't have that is the people who showed up like, I want your product. I love your product. I just want to buy your product. It was oftentimes just a one and done. But if I had the relationship, that was return business. And we know from a business standpoint, it's better to hold on to the business that you already have than to spend the money to go and find new business. See, there's already many ways that anyone can leverage the party or the gift of storytelling and communication. I like that you talked about your RON, the return on networking, but then also mm-hmm. using it as a connecting point with your customer. So why why do we need to? So let's go into it. Like, here's why you need to listen to what we're going to talk about today. Why do we need to be better storytellers? It, it's, it's in our DNA. Right? It's in our chemical makeup. We as, as a species, that's how we process things. The, the, the majority of the population, if I, and I'm, I'm going to apply the 80-20 rule, I know that's not the correct statistic, but it's just the ease of numbers. 80% of people process information best when there's a story attached to it. 20% of the population are, are, are the engineers and the ones that are very front brain in the neocortex. So they just give me the data, give me the data, give me the data. But the story is still key because... When we, when we tell a story, there's a specific part of the brain that we're speaking from and to. And this is where the science and the voodoo come together. And it's absolutely incredible. When we tell a story, we're speaking from an area of the brain called the limbic mind, also called the mind's eye. It's where all of our experiences and all of our memories and all of our feelings are stored. There's no words here. There's just emotional feelings. When we're telling a story from that, we're actually reliving that moment. When you tell the story, and this is a critical component to to telling good stories, is when we tell the story in real time, as opposed to back in such and such a year, I was doing this, saying the year's 2011, and cautiously I'm crossing the street. 
we've built out the scene. The audience is right there with us. We're moving forward through this moment in time right along with us. And as we relive this experience, the listener is reliving the experience right along with us. And when we arrive at our conclusion, they arrive at their conclusion at the same time. So if you want to be persuasive, storytelling is one of the most powerful tools that you can use. In fact, the people who've perfected this are known as con men. Right? <laughs> They're awesome at it, which is, which is why storytelling has a little bit you know, of, of a bad reputation, a little bit of a dark side, but con men or con people, let's be PC, they're the best at this because they will just get you wrapped up in the story and believing it. And then you're making an emotional purchase, which is how we'd make most of our purchases is on an emotional level. So when we're telling this story in real time, the listener is listening. We're speaking from our limbic mind, speaking to somebody's limbic mind, and we are actually imprinting our ideas and our feelings and our thoughts into their mind. And then when you make the jump from the limbic mind to the rational mind, the neocortex, that elasticity comes around and makes the two connect. So now we have got the 80-20 rule, right? You've got people that are story bound. They'll think of the story and then think of the facts. Then you've got people who are fact bound. They'll think of the facts and relate the story. On its own, you're going to be speaking to a small slice of your audience. And even then, what's missing is the why. Right? The story is your why. Right? We, we've all had a boss come up to us and he's like, hey, I really need you. I, I, I wash dishes for a long time. Yeah, you, th those pots aren't clean. You need, you need to scrub those down a little bit further. I'm like, no. Nah. Turns away. I put them back on the line again. And then he comes back to me. He's like, you know, when, um, when I was in your position, I was scrubbing pots and pans. And one time I, I, didn't get it, I didn't get it completely clean. And there was a bacteria that built up inside of it. And as a result of that, we ended up getting a foodborne illness in a restaurant that I was working at. That's why I need you to clean the pots and pans to where they are clinically and, and hermetically clean. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's why I need to do this. Okay. I'm more likely to clean the next pot in the pan to a, to a higher degree than just being told what to do. So your story is, why do you do what you do? And if you can lead with that, Right? I know we're jumping around a little bit here. This is the joy of talking to someone with ADHD. The, the, the joy of this is like in a networking environment, one of the most common questions you ask or get asked is what, Jen? What do you do? What do you do? I'm in finance. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a dentist. There's, I'm, I'm a plumber. There's so many of those. They're just going to lump you in. What's your right. differentiator? You've, you've missed that opportunity. So as opposed to leading with, with what you do, you can lead with a belief statement, which for, for mine, you've heard Jen say it, when I'm in a networking situation and somebody says, so Keith, what do you do? I start off with, I believe that unintentional audience abuse is preventable. And they get to people just to kind of like, because they're not expecting it. I'm leading with a why statement. I'm leading why it is that I do what I do. I want to prevent this thing that you've never heard of. Right? And then what that allows me to do from there is, is to parlay it into a story. They're like, well, what does that mean? How do you do that? When did you first figure this out? All these things have additional stories to go along with it. And you have a chance to be engaging. I think, so what's funny, Keith, is I was doing a different, <clears throat> I think I was doing a podcast interview and I, I quoted you, right? Like I, that Keith Bailey always has this expression, you know, I, that you prevent an unintentional audience abuse. And this person like had to write it down because it, I feel like that's such a captivating, relatable statement that so many people are like, yes, oh my gosh, please, yeah. could you please do that for either my team meetings or do that for the next organizational event? I think it's so relatable. And I like that. Yeah, it does break away from the traditional. This is what I do. This is how mm -hmm. I do it. I don't even like answering those questions anymore because I feel like it's so no one's really listening, right? We're just sitting there because it's the same thing. But then you say a statement like I prevent unintentional audience abuse. And yeah, it absolutely like, wait, excuse me. Tell me more. Mm -hmm. it, like, it, we dis don't... it disrupts. <laughs> so yes, you're quoted. I quote you now. Keith wow. So, <laughs> where, where do people get it wrong? Where do people <laughs> get storytelling wrong? I mean, where, what does really the accidental audience abuse look like or unintentional audience abuse look like? In, in, in a story, right? In, in a story specifically yeah. where where does that unintentional part happen uh 
a good story is a short story, right? An anecdotal story. What tends to happen is uh, people, they, they start telling it like they, I, I feel like I gotta go back to the beginning of time when the earth was still cooling to get people to really understand my position and where the story comes from. They don't. What you want to do is you want to start the story as close to that moment in time where something happens, right? If you think about the, the story about the presenter, right? I'm sitting in the theater, the lights go down, she sits down next to me. The action is starting. I don't have to give you, you know, the, the viewpoint from the dove's perspective is I just need to land it in the moment. So uh, people who do that, somebody who never gets to the point, right? The story goes on and on and your audience is like, what? Are they still talking about that? What are they even talking about anymore? <laughs> I, That's I when people start to shut off their Zoom cameras. <laughs> right? Like, oh, oh. <laughs> look at yes. this pretty thing. That tells me great stories. Look at the social media. And social media is all about telling short stories, whether it's in pictures, right? A picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, in, in that, it's a short story. And the, the Instagram posts and the TikTok posts and all those that, that do really well tell a really good, specific, concise, and memorable story. So if your story doesn't have one of those or all three of those elements in it, it's likely not a good story. Yeah. And I, you know, I like that you mentioned, here's your first start. Think of the story, but only start the story at the point of the action, because yes, mm -hmm. that's when it does border on it becoming too long. Or I think then someone ends up, you know, describing, starting the story, and then they describe everything up to it. And then they start with, well, long story short, and then yeah. they get into the story of what actually matters. When somebody says long story <laughs> short, you're in for a long, long, story. long story. Yeah. <laughs> we have a great friend of ours, and uh, everybody has tells, which is why I like playing poker. And his tell was, when John would take a knee, you're done. That's it. He's going to be down there for a while telling you the longest story that you've ever heard. And all you can pray for is that his knees start to hurt. So he stands up, but his knees aren't going to hurt because John's a plumber and he's comfortable <laughs> in that position. <laughs> so yeah, people are too long with it. Um, maybe even what about the information that they provide? Like, so if they st tell a story that's too long, but what about in terms of how we're crafting the story? Where do we get it wrong? Trying to get too many points across. And that's one of the things that also led me down this path to where I am now is when I started working with, with business professionals on their presentation, like, all right, I got 10 minutes. I need to get these six points across. There isn't a story in the world or an audience in the world that's going to be able to retain all of that, no. right? It's, it's pick what is, what is the, this is where the one word came from, is on these presentations, I would ask them, we need to boil this thing down to one word. What's the one word that really encapsulates and embodies the message you're trying to deliver? So with what it is that you're telling, if your story has like six different meanings, that's okay. Pick the meaning that is correct for the audience. Because what you're delivering to, to, to lawyers is different for the meaning that what you're going to be delivering to civil engineers or what you're going to be delivering to, to college students, right? The ones that you're going to be chatting with. So be aware of your audience and what their needs are and tailor your story's meaning to fit that audience because nothing is worse when you're sitting, sitting there. Another form of unintentional audience abuse is when the story is told and it has absolutely nothing to do with you. <laughs> and then I found $5. That's what comes to mind is when people add expressions like that to try and make your story more interesting or have more excitement to it. Uh, for those that might be unfamiliar, that's just a, maybe a sarcastic phrase that people will attach if someone has said a story that doesn't have a, maybe a point and then they'll try to make it interesting by making a joking comment like and then you found twenty dollars which adds that excitement but yeah we all know it's so interesting we all know what a bad story looks like yep. because we feel it right like that's when you feel it where you're either maybe disconnecting or you're just kind of confused as to why <laughs> they're yeah. telling that and I know we want to we're, we're going to dive into now tips to tell stories but be, or better stories but before we get into that the one thing I do want to talk about is the one word concept that articulated intelligence did come up and um, share. So as some of you might know, I, you know, 
director of the Denver chapter of the National Speakers Academy, and we brought in articulated intelligence to help our speakers with their storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring up the one word because there's a lot of people that initially, even though they're professional speakers, were initially like, how do I find my stories? What do I share? Yeah. And your the one word concept that you and your team had developed was one of the most impactful takeaways, I think, for the participants that went through Academy because it made storytelling easy and it was a formula that. And so I, I just want to give you some props for those that might be thinking that storytelling is still hard or where do you even start that you did lay down a really great framework for how you can do that and how you can recall your own stories, just thinking and using that one word. I'm mm -hmm. not sure what we can share on the podcast because I don't want to take away from any proprietary information, but I, I just, I, I'm happy to share this because it's, it's, it's such a fundamental tool. And if you, if you, if you embrace this, right for us, it is the. Uh, uh, what, what's, what's what I'm looking for? Foundational, right? With one word is a foundational tool. So I'm, I'm happy to share it with you because for so much of the work that we do, we come back to this foundational tool and it's one that allows you to, to tap into that bottomless story well. And a lot of the work that we do after this that I, I'm, I'm not going to share on this podcast, one, we don't have enough time for it. But if you just embrace this tool for the next time you have to present, you're going to find relevant stories because what happens as well, and this is, I think this is a really important tip, is that first story that you think of may not be the right story for your audience. Right. So to be able to go back to the well again, and what tends to happen sometimes with us is like we stress out and I can't think of anything good, which is why the tenant that we preach is first thought, best thought. It's a way that Allen Ginsberg, the, the poet, explained how he came up with this poetry. He's like, I would just open my mind and the first thing that popped in my head, I would write it down. And he would just go through his exercise that way. Now, granted, afterwards, he would go back and he'd clean it up and he'd tighten it up like it wasn't a first draft that he would publish. But it, this idea of first thought, best thought is liberating and freeing. So when you're sitting down in a creative state, adopt this whole first thought, best thought. Because if you disregard the first thing that pops into your head, you're like, no, 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 no I can come with something better. It creates stress for the brain. And when stress happens in the brain, that part of the brain shuts down. It goes to fight or flight. So what's and an example of like a first thought, best thought? Like how, what would that look like for someone that might be like, I don't know, what's the first thought? I have a lot of thoughts. Like, how do you just decide? Is it starting with who's your audience? And what is the not, first not, thought not, that you not, have? Not even, not even, not, not at first, at first, no, in the creative process, this is, this is long before I sit down with the audience. I just want to be able to just pull some things out of my head. I just want to just come up with some stories and come up with some ideas. I'm not initially, uh, audience centric. That is something as I'm moving further along, I have this collection of stories. Now I have, my, now I don't know who my audience is. I'm gonna start shaping that story to, to bring it closer and have it really fit to my audience. But to start in the very beginning with audience in mind, because as a speaker and a presenter, we're gonna be speaking to different audiences and we can right. mold those stories in. First thing that I focus on is let's, let's, let's just go find some stories. Let's just go look back and let's start looking at our experiences in our life through the lens of a storyteller. That, that to me is the most important skill that we can teach because once I've taught you that skill, you can pretty much take any, any event that's happened in your life, mold it and shape it and be able to attach a meaning to it because our minds do that automatically. And, and the way we do that, and I'll, I'll change my background here in a second, but I want to give a, 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 a credit where credit is due because the, the game that we're about to play is not my idea. With one word is my idea. And there's a, uh, a game that comes after this one that we really uh, focus on our proprietary process. This game came to me, uh, or this format came to me as a result of, of this book, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, if you're into reading Story anything, worthy. it's called Story Worthy. It's by Matthew Dix. I'm gonna send you a couple of links that you can put in the show notes. One of the stories that's in the book, and I recommend getting the audio book, because storytellers tell stories. Uh, he has on a, I think it's on a, on a it's, oh, he was the moth grand slammingest uh, champion ever. And it was the director of the moth who uh, imparted this knowledge upon him of playing this format. 
So I, I want to give credit where credit's due because right. I did not create the format I'm about to show you. The whole with one word as a as a trigger and the guided visualization and all that stuff, that's 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 all this 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 brain housing group here. Okay? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, you, you want you want to play you want to play a quick game? I do want to play a quick game. This is the first time playing a game on the podcast. So yeah, I'll take it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's play a game. We're gonna play a game called First Best, Last and Worst. And the way that this game works is a word is going to appear in this box. Actually, we're going to give you word because I don't have a slide that puts the word in there. Uh, but we're going to give you a word. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about your first experience with that word. I want you to think, think about your best experience with that word, your last experience with that word, and even your worst experience with that word. And know this about worst experiences. What is terrible for you is awesome for the story. Because people love, you know, they love, they love a good... Uh, uh, a, a good, terrible story that has a great ending to it. So here are, t this is one of our ways that we can start to craft better stories. And, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to give you a word. It's one of our foundational words that we like to use because great stories come out of this, but you can put any word into this box and, and, and play this game over and over again to start tapping into that story well and pulling those ideas out. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. So our word, gender wall, our word is the word teacher. Now. I want you to think of your first teacher that you can think of. Think of a name, if you can, or a description. Just visualize it. Don't say anything. Think of your best. Think of your last. And think of your worst. Yeah. Got them all? I do. Okay. The story that you're going to be sharing with us is going to self-select after I say these next words. And as soon as it self-selects, that's the story you're going to focus on. Okay? A story is about a moment in time where something happens. With one of those teachers, what is a moment in time where something happened between you and that teacher? Do you see it? Yeah, I've got two that come to mind, yes. Okay, I want you to, pick, I want you to pick, pick one. Okay. I want you to go back. You can close your eyes if you want to. I want you to put yourself back into that moment. Where are you? Who is there? What is happening leading up to this moment in time? What is the moment in time? And what does it mean to you today? Yes, I've got, I was so reluctant to want to share the story, but I've got the story. All right. That's, and so what we focus on is we focus on, on search shape. And then the critical part you're about to do is the sharing of the story. If you're going to become a storyteller, don't sit down and start writing your story now because you're becoming an author. Share the story out loud. And a first telling is a beautiful telling, right? Ladies and gentlemen, unscripted, unrehearsed, un well, slightly prompted, Jen's story on teacher. The stage is all yours. Okay. So when you gave the word of teacher and you talked about first, best, last, and worst, and then with your additional prompts, I was initially going to talk about best. That was initially where I think of Mr. Van Gumpel and how I even got to be interested in leadership. But the answer, as you gave the prompting questions, came down to, I'll leave this individual anonymous, but this was a teacher that I had when I was, I had him through high school and I didn't necessarily care for him. I felt like this teacher maybe got a little bit too involved in student dramas, if you will. Like it was just very awkward to have a teacher that was so engaged in maybe some of the mis happenings between kids. And I'm going to just really, or I'm going to show you that I was maybe not the greatest kid, but my senior year, right before graduation, I had been good all through high school. I was a big rule follower. And then right before graduation, I decided to throw a party. And so I threw this party and, you know, and Mind you, this is right before graduation. I had a few speeches lined up because I was in NHS and I had a few different scholarships that I was given because it was upon graduation. But I threw this party. It was, you know, two weekends before graduation. I threw this party and I get back to school on Monday morning and this teacher pulls me into his office and he says, like, I heard from Peter that you had a party this weekend. And I was like, I did. And he's like, do you know that I could take away all your scholarships from you right now just because of what you did? And my smart response, 
right? So this will, I'll always remember is this teacher would often have students over to drink at his house after graduation. And so then my smart response was to him, well, if you want to take away my scholarships, then you'll probably have to stop serving kids under age. <laughs> this is such a bad story, but I always think of it because it was this moment where I realized that like there was a double standard between maybe how someone was showing up and what they were putting on me because you were maybe disciplining me and I get all the rights, right? I, you know, there were all these scholarships that I definitely was justified, but on the flip side, you were trying to reprimand me when I know also that you had just had a bunch of people that were my age over in your backyard to do that. And that was so inappropriate. So I don't even know where that story went. I cannot believe I shared this story of high school, but I always think of it because it really, really made me mad. And I was so good during high school that to be caught out and like have someone want to pull that away from me right towards the end when they were also doing not okay things, like really got under my skin. I don't even know, if, Keith, if that was a story that you were looking for. <laughs> That's a perfect story. That's a perfect story. Let, let's talk, let's talk about this story because this, this uh, conversation is about storytelling, right? Now we yeah. have a, a raw, fresh example of a first time of a, of a telling of a story. Yeah. Uh, my encouragement is, is after this, you need to tell this story again to whoever you have a house full of people. The stuff you shared with us leading, it's two weeks before high school and, and all that, I would, I'd trash can that. I would, I would scrub that away from the story because we want to get as close to the moment in time, right? So you can start the story off with, we also want to tell the story in real time. So it's, it's Monday morning, two weeks before graduation, and I have just thrown the party of a lifetime. <laughs> Mr. Such and Such, who has been the bane of my existence, pulls me into his office. And I'm like, oh, what does this guy want? As he's sitting across from me, looking very intimidating, he says, and then you say whatever the words are, right? What's happening here is we've given a moment where it's in real time, and now there's a dialogue that is happening between you and, and another person. So we fill the stage with another person. That enriches the story. And we get to, as the listener, experience this exchange, like we're sitting in that room. Perhaps you give a, a little descriptor, right? It's, a, it's, it's his office, which I swear is the janitor's broom closet. It paints a picture of the mind's eye. And we're sitting in there, and he's grilling me on this stuff. And as he's doing this, I'm thinking to myself, what a hypocrite. What a complete hypocrite. And the words that come out of my mouth, to this day, I don't know where they came from. Because I leaned across the table. And I said this, and that's where you deliver, right? Because we know that you just had a thought while he's berating you, and then you deliver your, your story, and then you can end it there because that's, that's the end of it. And then turn and give your, your meaning to it, right? I don't like the double standards in people, which is why I believe that you need to be who you are and what, whatever meaning we want to attach to. Right? There's so many, like if you're, if you're going to present this for your college uh, for your college students, we can find what it means for college. If you're going to be delivering this for, for business professionals, we can find what it means to business professionals. But it's a great analogy of a story where you experience someone who was not doing what they were saying. Yes. And I love that because you're so right. If I think about the audience of even of this podcast and why I would, I'm like more mortified that I shared that story. But um, just even thinking about if I use this for leaders, the basic thing I would say is you've got to, you know, walk the walk. Like if you're not walking the walk, how are you ever going to anticipate or expect someone yeah. to follow in your footsteps yep. or to listen to what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> because, because your subordinates will see through you, right? You can say, so here, let's talk a little about circle reference real quick. You can make that open-ended statement, which on its own is weightless, has zero value and zero resonance, re resonance to your audience of leaders that you're speaking to. You're like, you need to walk the walk, you need to do this. It's like that guy telling me, you need to scrub the pants. Why do I need to scrub the pants, right? Your abordance will see straight through this. I remember when I was in high school, it was Monday, two weeks before graduation. I had just thrown the, right? Now you've given the meaning, you're about to tell the story. You're the subordinate in this story, yes. and you end up setting the, the, the leadership straight with your defiance. And as a result of that, that's why you don't ever want to do that. While your subordinates may not say anything to you, they're thinking it. Yes. Right? That's, that's when that story, and you can make that thing really, really short and concise, has such power 
to the meaning that you're trying to deliver. Because you, in the circle reference, you've said it twice. This is what it means. Here's the story. And this is why it means that. My gosh. So for those that are following along, this is, I love this tool, this game, if you will, because we obviously did not talk about this. I, I don't know if I would have ever shared that story in the podcast, but really what, for those that are joining this via audio and listening to this, what Keith has behind him is a sign that says one word. And so the word was teacher. And then my goal was to think of my first teacher, my best teacher, my last teacher and my worst teacher. And that that's all it was to come mm-hmm. to that story that all came down to a head of, you know, this example for leadership. You, your prompt wasn't what's a leadership story. It was think about your first teacher, your best teacher, your last teacher, your worst teacher. And derived from that was a story about leadership. I just, I love the simplicity of this, that we did that and came with a story. And obviously like, you know, I can still, I have yeah. to fine tune it, but it's, it's really great that you can do that in such a short amount of time. Yeah. And that's where I think it, what this tool is so is just helpful because people that think that they don't have stories, this is a simple tool to be yep. able to start to find your stories. And just like you coached me through, like we found a meaning that I didn't ever really realize. I never planned on sharing my defying moment of uh, being 18. This is 20 years ago. Um, and what I would yeah. have said, <laughs> but how likely are you to use this story now, now that you have this great meaning behind it? Like how is, is it, is that, is that the next time you see this double standard happening? Right? Are you going to use it then? Are you going to use it in a presentation? Yeah, I mean, I think about it now. Like, think if even when people, if I'm talking to people about how to work with kids, like kids know I was 18 and I absolutely knew what was right and wrong. And I was also not afraid to talk about that because I was probably just the level of inappropriate in my insubordination (laughs) because I'm a little bit more direct like that. And I think integrity is my high value, but I I just love how quickly that we could deduce that. And yeah, maybe I would share that story of that person because it is still something to this day that like sticks with me because I just, I couldn't handle the fact that they were scolding me for something that they don't follow themselves. Like, and it's, it's awful to feel that someone's reprimanding you, berating you, saying whatever, if they're not following through it. So I just, there's so many ways that I can think about that. So you talked about the circular reference, telling the story in real time. So knocking out the fact that, you know, I was there, like here I was on Monday morning. What is Ote's observation? That was another tip that you put in there. Ah, OT, OT, David, OT. Dave, Dave, David Ot, David Ot, David Ot is a uh, professional speaker. He's a member of the National Speakers Association, Colorado chapter. He's he's an engineer and he speaks to storytelling for for science and for engineering. And uh, Ot's observation uh, is is when you add a color and a number to a story, it makes those little details in that story just that much more memorable. And, and he, he doesn't know why we've had conversations. I've, I've done uh, some collaborations with him and I've seen him put it to work and he'll tell this story. And then later on, like a long time later on, he comes back to it again. It's like, and who can remember the, the, the color of my pants? And it was like khaki. All right. What was, uh, what was the color of my truck? They're like, it was black. Right. And like, he pulls these things forward. How many years had I been in the business? They're like 23, like People are able to recall these things wow. because they stand out. So a adding a color and a number uh, really helps with making the picture just that much more rounded. Kind of like the same thing what we said, right? Giving that location and giving an analogy, right? Yeah. My, my teacher's office was, I swear he was put in the janitor's broom closet. It paints the picture for the audience. They're just able to allow, to, allows them to visualize what a, a janitor's broom closet looks like and perhaps even smells like it or perhaps even tastes oh like it was a science lab it was a chemistry teacher and it was there are beakers everywhere you can think of the bunsen burners at each of the tables <laughs> and yeah well, it smells like formaldehyde <laughs> it, so so in your story is you don't have to say the beakers and the bunsen burners because just by saying it was a science lab that had this pungent formaldehyde smell 
that just opens up a whole window of senses and imagination that your audience, this is the gift that you give to your audience by not over explaining someone, right? By trying to draw out what the everything in the room looked like is too much. You want to leave things to the audience's imaginations, which is why pausing is so important. If you were to tell this story is Mr. So-and-so pulls me into his office, which is the science room. Pause. Let the audience fill in the room with stuff. And it had an overarching, pungent smell of formaldehyde. Pause again. Let the audience smell the formaldehyde. Let them take in some kind of, you know, uh, uh, malodorous odor and scent. Let them experience that. So one of the bis- biggest gifts you can give your audience, silence. Silence allows them to fill in those little tiny gaps and those little things within the story and enriches the story for them. If you just bulldoze right through the whole thing and speak like the micro machine man, which dates me, he's the man who can speak the fastest of any language and able to sell things. He used to sell a little tiny about micro cars. But if you speak that fast, your audience is all they're trying to do is keep up. Yeah, that's a good, so. great like final closing points because I know we have to go, like embracing the pot. And giving people the opportunity to place themselves in your story with that pause, Mm -hmm. not thinking that they're just waiting for you to get over as fast as possible, which I think sometimes when you're a little nervous, we can feel like our audience wants, but they want you to be successful. And that's maybe how we'll end it. Keith, how do people get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, You can find me on LinkedIn, Keith M. J. Bailey. You can find our website at articulated-intelligence.com. Uh, and then my email is Keith at articulated intelligence.com. Thank you so you can, much, Keith. So you find, or, to- or you know what, or you can do, you can reach out to Jen. She's got my cell phone number. She'll I be able do. to put you in touch with me <laughs> right away. <laughs> I do. No, you reach out to articulated intelligence. I have seen your work um, true with these speakers. I can't tell you enough just how you made storytelling so easy and this might sound like a commercial, but I I think it's just such an important skill that people need to know that it was so neat to watch the confidence of one of our speakers, especially that took the story Uh and went all the way to moving up in their Toastmasters competitions, all because of this story. So if you want to reach out to the team at Articulated Intelligence and Keith, I would recommend it heading over there. I've seen it work. Keith, thank you so much for sharing this tool with us. And I just thank you so much for being on the show. I really am grateful for you. And yes, for those, please, Please stop and think about how you can prevent unintentional audience abuse. Thank you so much, Keith. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate it. See you guys soon. Live life well spoken. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Leadership Habit Podcast. I hope that you had fun hearing how we can play that one word and that you are going to take that technique or reach out to Keith and his team at Articulated Intelligence. For those that want to connect with Keith, just as a reminder, the website is articulated-intelligence.com. They can help you with your storytelling, help you to network better or get that RON, and of course, engage your customers. If you know someone that could benefit from this podcast episode, please share it with them. And of course, if you like this week's episode, give us a rate and review on your favorite podcast streaming service. And finally, if you want to be a better leader or want to develop a team full of great leaders, please reach out to us. We would love to come into your organization or your team to help you convert and develop your managers into leaders, leaders that show that they care and get results. Until next time.